If, if, if both strokes are uh, necessary for evolution, could you say that, say, being, look, being a man is natural, any man is naturally going to be interested to know if following his dharma and being totally external, he will be able to find something of lasting value in that way of life? Oh, yes. yes. Oh, yes. So that is what man has to do, that in all externality, he must portray the inherent internality. In other words, that which is within himself, inherent within himself, in all his outward actions of protecting and providing, all those outward actions must be underlined or stimulated or regenerated by that inward quality which is inherent in man. And thereby he becomes a better provider and protector. Because now, although his actions are more external, it must not be devoid of the eternal qualities within him. So, therefore, I am a great believer in the householder life. Therefore, to experience these things, I became a householder. I was born to be a monk, but I wanted to learn what householding is because my teachings are aimed at householders. Now, when a man and a woman gets married, the woman, because of the qualities, the internal qualities, the equipment she has, can stimulate the internal qualities of the man so that he could translate it in external qualities. You see how man and women are complementary to each other. The woman in turn also needs to externalize herself. And the best way the woman can externalize herself is by outwardly stimulating the internality of the man who expresses it externally and makes life beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it is such fun. Beautiful. <laughs> okay. You are a master. <laughs> you know, uh, Manu Smriti, the code of Manu, this is from Eastern scriptures. Um, he has said that happy is the home where the woman is held in high esteem. Happy is the home where the woman of the home is worshipped as a goddess. If men only start worshipping their wives as a goddess, then, believe you me, the wife will start worshipping the husband as a god. There's no two ways about it. It's inescapable because the qualities in the woman are so fine. You know, when they say that woman is God's finest creation, I agree with that. I do. <laughs> there is no difference. There is no difference. In the spiritual sphere, there is no gender. In the spiritual sphere, there's no spirit which is female and there's no spirit which is male. It is only the externality that divides up this is man and that's women. Internally, essentially, it is all one. It is just these expressions. Right? And these expressions are necessary as man and as woman so that together they could find the essence which is one. And that is how love grows. When man says to women that, ah, oh, the essence in you is me and the essence in me is you, hmm? that's how love grows. Yes. But if you want one dies, then they want one dies to Yes, oh yes. Oh, yes. Oh. Pardon? Oh, they are. Oh, yes, they are. Yes. Very wonderful, beautiful guru. Like we had a lady coming here quite often to Cape Town. She's been here two, three times, Swami Ridan, and a wonderful guru, wonderful woman. 
wonderful. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Oh, yes, very wonderful. You, you have gurus. And then, of course, you have different kinds of gurus. And, uh, you have a guru, then you have the guru of gurus. Hmm? You have the royal guru also. <laughs> yes. Self realization of yes. 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 Sorry, how one grows in appreciation of finding truth and finding truth. That's one thing. Eventually, come that finding truth. Oh, yes, oh, yes. That is called self realization. That is complete integration. Yes, I've said it all. Nevertheless, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Self-realization, there is no difference between self-realization and God-realization. It's the same. Because the self is what we call God. And as we go on appreciating the finer and finer stratas of the finer and finer range of truth, we at the same time become just as fine as the truth is fine. And we become one with the truth. So when Christ said, I am the truth, I am the way, huh? that was very true. That was very true. Because when you reach the fineness, truth, you become the truth. Yes. And becoming that truth is self-realization. What do we need for self-realization? Firstly, we need the self, and then we need realization. <laughs> <laughs> now, does the self require realization? No. The self, capital S, the real self is realized. It does not require realization. That real self within us does not require any realization. It requires unfoldment. It requires unfoldment not for itself. What unfolds is the veils that has been drawn upon it. Hmm? So, what shall we call the veils? Let us call it the small self. So, the one that requires realization is the small self. And how does the small self realize itself? The small self realizes itself by annihilation. <laughs> So when the small self annihilates itself, then what would remain is the big self who is realized as it is. Hmm? As small self to self-consciousness? Small self means? Do you mean self-consciousness? The small self means the body, the mind, which is the carrier of impressions, it also has intellect and it also has ego. Now, all these things which I have said, the body, of course, with its senses, the mind, the carrier of impressions with its qualities, and the intellect, which thinks it discriminates by its own steam, it doesn't. It still requires being powered up by the big self. And the ego that reigns over the small self, being part of the small self. The ego is like the head of a person. 
while the other things I mentioned is like the limbs of the small cell. Now, how does one proceed to annihilate the small self? That is the question. The procedure to annihilate the small self can be done by discrimination by the intellect. So that virtually means that the small self has to use itself to annihilate itself. Is that clear? <laughs> yeah. We also call that the petty self in effect, because pettiness is just weakness in a human being. True, right? true, true. Pettiness is also a portrayal of the small self, one of the aspects of the small self. Right. So the small self uses itself to annihilate itself. That one aspect is through the power of discrimination. So in the aspects I mentioned, we use the intellect and we analyze. Is this or is this not? The intellect has vast powers. It has powers of deluding you and also has powers of instructing you. Truthfully, it has those powers. Once we gain some mastery of the intellect through our practices, we will find that it will discriminate between what is right and what is wrong. It will discriminate between the differences of the mind, body, and of the ego. Because of its force, because of its discriminatory power, it can say to the ego, sit down, my boy. You've been jumping around enough already. <laughs> yes. That is one way. The other way is to forget the intellect and just leave it to emotion. The emotion is mostly of the mind. Feeling, which of course translates itself through the body. So in emotion, we develop devotion. We develop the feeling. The noon gun again. It also says it's true. Uh, we develop devotion, which is feeling. So the first path was the path of discrimination, where we use the intellect to do things for us. The other path is using feeling. Thinking is the one principle of discrimination. Feeling is the other principle which we are talking about now. And through feeling, we become devoted to an object or an ideal. We become so devoted that we forget the thinking. We exist in feeling, we exist in emotion. That is Bhakti Yoga. And by intense one-pointedness to a certain object created by devotion, by feeling. Feeling, proper feeling, directed towards self-realization, always produces positive results. It always produces positive qualities in us, such as love in whichever minor form, it produces love. And through that intense love, through that intense one-pointedness, we also can get rid of the small self. And then we say, thou art the doer, not I. The small self is not the doer. Thou, the big I is the doer. And we surrender ourselves completely. So in the path of bhakti yoga, in the path of feeling, 
emotions we have surrendered and say i am nothing but thou are it good then we talked about thinking we talked about feeling now we talk about action that's the other path where we live virtuously we don't want to know what the intellect what wonderful stories the intellect can cook up mm? <laughs> we don't want to know that we don't want to know who, what the heart what devotion the heart has we only want to know the uh, i must do my duties in life i do my duties towards my parents i do my duties towards my brothers sisters i do my duties towards my children to my wife to my society and i live a good life do good be good you know, that is the path of action okay. these three paths can take one to the annihilation of the small self and once the small self is annihilated then there is realization okay. now these three paths of thinking feeling and action can be stimulated by the fourth path that we are practicing these various techniques of meditation these various techniques of meditation which can fall under raj yoga stimulates the action part of life stimulates the feeling part of life stimulates the thinking part of life it becomes the backbone of those three other paths therefore it is called raj yoga the royal yoga hmm? so we use these once we start on our practices to raj yoga we automatically activate and stimulate and put into its practical use So we put into its practical use all the aspects of life. Good. So the whole idea is the annihilation, or perhaps while being embodied, is the subjugation of the small I, so that we exist from that level of absoluteness. from the big i which is in itself self realized and the small i is subjugated it becomes our servant huh? yeah okay right. yes mm -hmm. but i imagine that once these three other powers of of Bhakti, Jnana Yoga, and Karma Yoga becomes activated. Okay. They don't. They don't. They, they don't operate separately, but in fact, they're they're they just sort of operate simultaneously in one individual. Um, I get the impression that that Karma Yoga and Bhakti Yoga involve surrender, also in Jnana. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that 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 Jnana Yoga compared with the other two are. That they're in a way opposed, and when you discriminate, there isn't an act of surrendering. In fact, it's not a law. It's not this. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that is true. That is how you start in the beginning with discrimination. Where in the beginning, in the path of discrimination, you'd say not this, not this, not this. But but as you progress on that path the discrimination will assume discrimination in its most humblest form the one kind of discrimination is assertive the other kind of discrimination is non assertive 
The one kind of discrimination and discriminates with a will. That is preconditioned to find certain answers. That if you mix um, yellow and green, you get blue. Hmm? Is that the way it works? Yellow and green? Blue. Yellow and blue. Yellow and blue makes green, I see. Could we have known here she's an artist? Ah, I see. Or whatever. So there is a predetermined, biased effort by the discriminatory mind. And that kind of discrimination is assertive. While when one goes beyond the assertive kind of discrimination, we come to a discrimination that discriminates for the sake of finding what is true. And when that discriminatory power wants to find what is true, it assumes a humble attitude. So, when that humble attitude is brought about in the discriminatory process, automatically you are dwelling into Bhakti Yoga. Huh? Because humility, humility is the blood brother of devotion. Automatically you're activating Bhakti Yoga as well. And by acting bhakti, uh, with Bhakti Yoga, with humility and devotion, your actions would be such. So there you are bringing in Karma Yoga. So whichever angle you start from, from which whatever temperament you have, you start according to your temperament. But as you progress, all these paths become one. They become part and parcel of each other. What do you call uh, the intellectual yoga? Gnan yoga. Gnan yoga. And bhakti yoga is the yoga of devotion. Karma yoga is the yoga of action. Yeah. Good. I'm thinking of carrying on from that concept as the last one for earlier. Is it possible to remove or to, to say we can immune to certain samskaras? You, you have mentioned to us that samskaras are uh, stored in a certain area of the psychic anatomy, if you to use that terminology. Is it possible, say, to, to clear a certain area without developing further, say, to clear, if I can use this terminology, chakra, a second chakra or first one, without having a fully developed third? Or if, is it possible to clear one chakra in isolation of the development of the others? Not. No. Uh, if you pinch your toe, your whole body feels it. Hmm? Good. So, the clearing of a particular chakra would have its effect on the other chakras as well. It must have its effect. And do not think that the storehouse of sanskaras is situated in a particular part of the anatomy. No. You are, as a whole, the sum total of your past sanskaras. Your very body shows it. Your very mind shows it. And how the purity of the spirit is covered over. Like a sheath. Hmm? So you yourself is the, sans the, the sum total of the sanskaras, yeah. What, what stimulated this again, remembering, is I wanted to know whether love would develop spontaneously without attention on feeling. You have said this in some measure in talking about um, denying and discrimination becoming uh, devotional. Mm -hmm. But if one say through some kind of technique or some process, you find out that a lot of one's ignorant action was based on misunderstandings in the past, would that need, that's an intellectual appreciation of, of mistakes one had made, would it lead to devotion? Or does one have separately to concentrate or rather put one's mind on 
mm -hmm. feeling so that the heart begins to develop. So that when oh yes, 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 yes. Uh, firstly, the, the the very idea of saying that misunderstandings have occurred in the past is to activate the discriminatory power. Because without that thinking, without that discrimination, you would have not have come to the understanding that you had misunderstandings. But this right? can be led to, uh, I'm thinking of there are various processes um, or scientific processes of questioning individuals which um, stimulate a realization or an awareness or remembering, good remembering of mistakes or misunderstandings having occurred in the past. And what I want to know is if this process alone could bring one to self-realization? Yes. No, because this process, you're apparently talking of psychoanalysis. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. They are of a very superfluous level. Superfluous level. Uh, the methods that, that some people use is one-sided only. They are drawing from one side only. In our method, we're using two sides. From the subtle level, we are giving it a push. And from the, 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 the conscious level, we are giving it a pull. If using superfluous methods and you are just pulling it out, there is a danger of leaving a void. <clears throat> and by leaving voids, many damages could be done to a person's whole way of life. Actually, the crux is the whole matter. If, if voids can exist where they would say, not be much wrong action, but there would be a, just no heart in somebody. True. No, no feeling. But no feeling because, because the method that was used was of the mind only. And the mind in the hands of a clever manipulator can make a person very, very robot-like. In our method, by giving a push from the subtle levels and a pull from the outer levels, a balance is preserved where the voids are filled up, where not only the superfluous level is tackled with the pull, but the push of the subtle level is also infused in that which is to be moved. If you push that heavy sofa, if you pull it, it is difficult, it is hard. But if there's someone behind there also pushing it, how much easier you could bring that heavy piece of furniture forward. Very sure. Chief, what, what, what um, area of one's being is it, it probably occurs mostly with men, <laughs> is their self will which says, I am go I'm going to achieve this aim mm -hmm. and I don't need anybody else's help because this concept has come about in, in, in connection with saying, why must you have a guru? What's a guru for? Are you weak? Do you need a crush? Mm -hmm. Are you, can't you stand on your own two legs? Um, mm -hmm. there, are, there are people who, who choose to decide to find a realization by themselves. They're going to whatever their methods they... Yes, now there are two kinds of people that could say that. Um, the one kind that say that I can find realization by myself belongs to 99.999% weak people that are deluded. <laughs> then you have the one fraction of a percent of a person that had reached great realizations already in the past lives, perhaps. And that just needs a little experience in this life to be able to stand on its own. That is also possible. But those are very few. They can be counted on fingertips. Hmm? Because those that don't need a guru are people that are born practically self-realized. Hmm? 
Now, how many self-realized people uh, have you met in this world? Or how many self-realized people are there? The rest, 99.99 people, are wayfarers. They are on the path to self-realization. And they, if they can find, if they're fortunate enough, because of their karma too, to find a teacher, it makes the path smoother, easier, more expedient, more faster, more fulfilling, more rewarding, more joyful, more blissful, more everything. <laughs> Good. We're going to have a solution. See, there's the long plan to become the role of all, who is 99.9 people. Mm. In their phase of evolution, because we still very, very. No, no. All the world is still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, they might not be all at the same level. Some could be at a higher level, some at a lower level. They're not necessarily in the same. No, no. For example, to reach, uh, say we are going to go to Salisbury, uh, some might have gone up the, uh, which is the way? Up north, isn't it? Yes. Mm, some might, <laughs> yes. Uh, some might be nearer Salisbury and some might be further away from Salisbury. Now, all this, of course, composed the 99.9% of people. Some could be nearly at Salisbury, hmm? but still they are in the category of the 99.9. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, well, look, this thing, this supposition on hypothesis can work if one uses an analogy with reality, it might not be any so. Um, we say a pilot who's learned all the controls of, say, like a guru um, or a guy, mm. and somebody who's learning to fly is an ignorant person, a tutor, somebody who's just learning to get the hang of it. Mm. Now, without a, a guide, a pilot guide, an experienced guide, a, a learner could eventually get to know how to control all those things, what all the knobs mean, what their values are, how to harmonize their action. But in the process would make mistakes, could you say that such a person who had gained that realization without, say, side help mm. through one's own, ex through own experience and through own error making would have anything extra that somebody, I don't feel as myself, but would... would no, you see, there... The, no, there is a matter of trial and error. Yes. Now, if there is a system where one can avoid trial and error. Yes. Hmm? Isn't it better? Yeah, I, I, yes. I feel it like is. It is better. No, it okay. is better. I know some years ago, <clears throat> I took up a course in journalism. And uh, before that, you know, I used to send away so many articles and stories as to get a lot of rejection slips. <laughs> now, the stories were good, right? Fine. You know, the construction was good. But there were a few technical errors. So I took up a course in journalism and mastered those errors. By taking up this course, I knew immediately through the teacher uh, what my errors were, uh, how badly I'd marketed the articles. You can write a very brilliant article and you send it to the wrong paper, naturally it would be rejected. So by taking up this course, I found the fundamentals of what journalese is. And after that, every article or every story I sent to the papers was accepted. The transformation took place within a few months. Before I had hundreds of rejection slips, and after that, every one I sent in was accepted. So now if the facility is there, you know, to find the teacher in journalism that could guide me what modern journalism is and how to write in journalese, why not take that opportunity if it is available instead of me going on still for years and years and years making mistakes? Huh? Very simple mistakes, simple technical mistakes that had to be corrected, but which made all the difference. Now let us have very interesting point to start off with uh, satsang. 
we're talking about truth and talking about God. And I'd like to ask you if you could talk about the, the sameness or the, the difference between what we call self and what we call God. And uh, in some way, the main that to truth. Because I've spoken to people recently about this concept of truth. What is actually true and what is perhaps absolutely true. And a lot of people, in fact, most people know of the concept of God. And uh, many religious people would feel that they actually have such contact. Um, could you say anything about the realness or the truth of a God experience, of, of God realization? Or say, say somebody prays and they feel they are making contact with God. Can one really say that is God they are contacting? Sure. Now, first, there is uh, one premise that we can start off from, that everything existent, be it of a relative nature or be it of an absolute nature, it is all the truth. The difference lies in degrees of truth. So, whatever you see happening is true. Certain truths are relative. Certain truths are relatively true, while other truths are absolutely true. Now, you would like to know the difference between what is relatively true and what is absolutely true. A relative truth can be experienced by the senses, by the body, by the mind. Now, in appreciation of relative truth by the body, naturally it would be a gross appreciation by the gross senses. We could not deny that this is not a table. This is a table. The concept of the table physically, in its grossness, we say that it is true that this is a table. Now we could have a mental concept of the table where we could dwell deeper into the constituents that make up the table. There, of course, science would teach us of the electrons, molecules, protons, etc. that come together, work in a certain formation in a precise way to make them all congeal. That is a mental concept. Now, what has been congealed as this piece of wood can be appreciated by the eyes, by the touch, and knocking it, we can hear it, etc. So here, in the acceptance of the table as truth, we are using two powers. The one is the mental power, and the other is the physical power, which is embodied within the senses, or rather the body, uh, 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 the physical body embodies for the senses. So here we have the appreciation of the truth of the table, physically and mentally. Now, if we should go further, and still go into a finer level of truth that if this table is there, which we can verify by mind and body, can it also be verified by that eternal quality that is within the table, which is the spirit. Now, it is a misconception that only human beings have a soul. Only human beings have the spirit. I would say that not only human beings have a spirit, but animals have a spirit, plants have a spirit, and so does anything material or mineral have a spirit. So we try to unfathom that quality, that spiritual quality of a table. Is that possible? Can the spiritual quality of the table 
be appreciated by the mind and body. The appreciation can only come at this moment by inference because that spiritual quality is intangible. Now, intangibility can be expressed. Intangibility. Intangibility can be expressed in that which is tangible. So, you start there from the gross level of the physical self of the table to the mental conception of the table. From there, we proceed to the spiritual conception of the table. Now the mind is happy in saying that there are certain laws of nature which govern the molecules which goes on to produce this table. But now what is that law of nature that makes the molecules turn in a certain fashion which causes its certain amounts of rotations or revolutions? What is that indefinable law which the mind and the body cannot understand? But the mind and the body can infer that there is the law. Once we get to the understanding of that law, although by inference, can we say that that law which exists in the formation of the table is the absolute truth. The mind appreciates it by inference. Yet, the mind is also capable of experiencing it. And it is only that inner experience conveyed through the medium of the mind that we can be sure that there is an absolute truth also in this table. So, to know the absolute truth, it has to be on the experiential level. The mind, as I said, could infer or have an inkling that that law is there, which is the absolute truth. But absolute truth, being of an infinite nature, cannot be fully appreciated by the finite mind. So we have to rely on inference, conjecture and assumption. But yet this assumption can be called valid because the questing mind has not found within the mind itself the complete answer of the absolute truth. So, this absolute truth can be experienced. There are people that can experience it. To use a very well-known analogy of the flower, we see, we feel, we touch the flower, yet the underlying truth of the flower is the invisible sap. Now, this analogy has been used by Sankracharya, by Ramanuja, uh, 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 it has been used by Vivekananda, by Ramakrishna, and recently the same analogy has been used by Maharishi. That the underlying quality of the flower, the eternal essence of the flower, the absolute truth of the flower is the invisible sap. So, let us go the, in the other way around. Let us say that the firstly, the invisible sap existed, and that invisible sap solidified itself into the forms of the yellow and the red and the white and the green of the flower. So this forms a composite whole. As I said last week, the one cannot exist without the other. So the physical appreciation is there by physical experience 
It is in turn appreciated by the mind, accepting the concept of the existence of the table and delving further, we appreciate the indefinable law that keeps this whole table together. So in the three stratas of truth, the physical, mental, and spiritual, it forms one composite whole. And the difference of truth, as I said in the beginning, is of degree. One is a lower truth. From there, we approach a higher truth, which could be called the finer truth. And from there, we go to the finest truth. Yet, these three aspects of the being of this table cannot be separated. Each of the truths, as we perceive it by our various vehicles, is interdependent upon each other. One cannot exist without the other. The law of keeping the atoms and the molecules together cannot exist if the molecules were not there. Hmm? And they cannot solidify into a solid form if the molecules were not there. If the law of that controlling indefinable power was not there. So it is one composite whole. We in practical life, what we try to do is proceed from a lower truth to a higher truth. Because everything that is observable, that is experienceable, is nothing but the truth. This could very well lead to the question of what is untruth? If we have the assumption of truth, then we can naturally ask, what is untruth? Untruth, in my teaching, does not exist. Untruth does not exist because if truth is omnipresent, where is the place of untruth? The untruths we feel or we see, we observe in this world is a superimposition upon truth. Because the mind has the ability, because man has free will, because the free will is superimposed upon that eternal law, the free will still has the power to turn and twist truth. And what is untruth is nothing but the turning and the twisting of the truth. It is like clay which could be molded into the shape of a mouse and which could be molded into the shape of an elephant. Could we say the elephant is true or the mouse is true? They're both truths, yes. But the underlying truth is the clay, the clay and the water. Now, if you would define clay and water in a different way, you could say the clay is matter and the water is energy. So these two aspects of the same thing goes around modifying things into different shapes and forms. What deludes us, what is regarded to be untruth, is only the shape and the form. And it is shape and form to which we add name that produces the conflicts in life, in practical living, where our minds battle with what is truth and what is untruth. Truth is the reality. Untruth is the unreality superimposed upon truth. So with our meditations, what do we do? We progress proceed from the web, from the veils 
of untruth to that underlying truth within us. And when we dive deeply, when we dive in meditation to the essence of ourselves, from that stable stand, from that foundation, we do find that that which we regard to be untrue is just tortured and twisted, misunderstood, misapprehended, and misconceived. Now, these philosophical concepts also has its practical value. Somebody comes to me and tells me an untruth. I look at the person. I would say that this person is truthful, but he is enmeshed in that seemingly untruth which is created by his mind and the free will, that power which has been given to him. Now, if I develop the ability to see beyond the apparent truth and go to the essence of truth and admit to myself that that man is truthful, then what happens to me is this, that I develop the power of forgiveness. Because the seeming, because I fathom that the untruth that existed there is non-existent, which is a delusion, then I can forgive that because I know that underlying this man's motives, the, the essence which activated this is true. So when I can see the truth in people, in spite of the outward actions, when I can see the depth of what they really are, then I can forgive, then I become compassionate, then I can love that person then I can say that condemn that superfluous act, but don't condemn the man. Condemn the superfluous act, but don't condemn the actor, and I will still love the actor. Now, by doing this, it is caused by, we develop these understandings, we develop these realizations by being able to dive within ourselves. Because when we know the essence of ourselves, we can very easily know the essence of others. Because the essence of so-called you and so-called me is the same. If you sit there and I sit here, we think we are apart. But really speaking, we are not apart. We are one composite whole, and science will prove to you that uh, um, there is either in the space between us that forms this complete whole, that is the subtle matter that cannot be seen by the naked eye, but it is there in existence which make one big solid whole. So when one comes to these realizations, by understanding oneself, by being able to dive deeper within oneself and finding the essence in ourselves, we see the essence in others. And by doing that, we can only love the essence in others because we know the essence in others is but the essence in me. And I cannot hate myself. I love myself. That is how we learn to love other things. Now the concept of God, as you mentioned, what do we know of that, of that abstract quality, of that law which we call God? We can only know God by the expression of God. We know the unmanifest by the manifest. We know the manifester by what he has manifested and his primal method of manifestation is love. So when through meditation I dwell deep within myself and by being able to dwell deep within myself, I see the essence, the depths of others, 
than I love. So here, the eternal law, which we call God, you can put any name, you can say Allah, God, Bhagwan, whatever, Yahweh, whatever name you want to give it, doesn't matter, it's still the same essence. So what I am doing, not only believing that there is an abstract quality called God, but I am practicing God. Because if the expression and the sum total of God is love, and I can activate that love in my environment, I am making that abstract quality into a reality. I am concretizing that which is abstract here and now. And as I said before, what is the most important thing? Which is the most important phase in existence? Not yesterday nor tomorrow, but now. So now I am actively activating the manifestation, the expression of divinity in my practical daily life by being able to love. Hmm? So when we love, we overcome every obstacle in life. Nothing hurts us, nothing harms us, because that force, love, which is God, love is God, God is love, is there. And then, if we activate that, could we say that we are true Christians, or could we say we are true Buddhists, or true Hindus, or true Muslims, or whatever religion. Religions are labels, paths. Hmm? So we take that abstract concept of love and bring it to daily living reality. And by doing that, do we live a godlike life? Then we are worthy of that belief in God. Otherwise, it is hypocrisy. Is that satisfying? Yes. Yes. Taking that, how would one know what was the most untainted or untwisted truth for oneself at a particular time? For example, if one's faced with a, faced with a question of, I have perception, uh, my mind, my senses are absorbing certain information at this moment, but I have a choice to make. I take this path or one of ten or one of two, whatever. True. How do I know which is going to be of highest value? Right. The, you, you don't even need to know. Because at a certain point in, in your evolution, at a certain stage of your development, if you follow your conscience, is this right? Then for you, at that stage of evolution, would be right. And as you progress further, as you progress further, you will find finer and finer rightness. In other words, finer and finer truths, deeper and deeper truths. So, I teach hope, never discouragement. So wherever we are, and if we conceive a certain thing very sincerely, very conscientiously, that this is truth, be it so, because as we progress through life, as we meditate and dwell deeper and deeper within ourselves, as, as we find the finer and finer qualities of ourselves, will we find the finer and finer qualities of truth. So the conception you have today might not be the conception or the perception that you will have in two years' time. Now, you don't need to ask a professor of philosophy if yesterday's conception was right or two years latest conception was right. You yourself will feel it. You yourself will know that that truth which I believe to the truth was a much grosser truth than the truth I believe in today, which is a finer truth. And you yourself 
being sincere, following the dictates of your own conscience of right and wrong, you yourself will know that, ha, ah, I have progressed. And when you realize certain progresses in your life, it will give you more encouragement to progress more. And then, of course, we gurus are there to encourage. Um, I'd like to ask Crystal that um, I thought we had to ask myself. I recently saw a film called um, One Fear and the Cuckoo's Nest. And this was about a mental institution. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are whole scenes throughout the film about that the people who are in charge of assisting and helping or letting the time um, are not competent to do so. And for people who cannot grasp their ways to get simple ideas, how can they be confident in them when they be helped? Because all the techniques that they have tried to get um, had do with their own history system, they never seem to get mm -hmm. to the source of the trouble. Absolutely. Now, now, that is the lack we have today in medical science and in psychiatric science. It is definitely a case of the blind leading the blind. Oh, yes. Because uh, uh, psychology and psychiatry is still in its very, very infancy. Uh, they cannot get to the root of the problems of human beings. Because to get to the root of the problem, one goes to the essence of one's being. Uh, it is no use treating the symptoms, as we know, we treat the cause. And there again, we have found through experience, um, meditation helps. Meditation helps, it activates that inner storehouse of energy within us and helps it to portray, uh, translate itself into mental and physical aspects of man, and it helps very much. So yes, it does. Certain understandings are gained by practice and by learning, and it can alleviate a lot of the problems. There are some people in mental cases which might uh, have irreparable damage. They might not be able to be cured completely, but if certain concepts are given to them, based on these eternal truths we have been speaking about, uh, they, they could find a great relief. Today, psycholo psychologists or, or psychiatrists, uh, they are just floundering. They are find, trying to find a way. And uh, they're learning. They're learning. They're learning very slowly. They're in the crawling stage, but we do hope that one day they'll start walking and then perhaps running. So they too, if they could infuse the, the modern science with these age-old ancient teachings and base all the researchers with a background of these teachings, you will find that uh, their experiments and their methods would improve, increase, and become more helpful. Yes, yes. And, uh, and uh, how could one practically uh, introduce the system? Because for a person who is violent, mm -hmm. they can't sit still long enough to, to be able to meditate. So what sort of would they exist? Oh, yes, you know, we say music soothes the savage breast. Hmm? The person could be, yeah, the person could be very violent, but bring him to me and let him sit five minutes in front of me. I would like to see how violent he is then. Hmm? So, therefore, we have to generate a certain kind of teacher that not only, that can not only appeal to the mind and body of a person, but also to his inner self. So that person who is so violent will not know what's happening to him. There are certain subtle energies and certain, certain subtle forces that are activated. 
by the good guru, by the good qualified teacher. And the, the, the psychiatrists, instead of the, the, all their teachings or all their practices being based on a very, very mundane level, if they could take up a course or practice spiritual practices, you know, they could be able to benefit their patients. If they themselves, uh, you know, as the joke goes, that uh, the, uh, the psychiatrists, many of them need psychiatrists themselves. Huh? Yes, many of them could be very unstable. So if they, if they, if those very psychiatrists could develop that stability within themselves through some of our yogic techniques, then it is not what they do to the patient externally, but internally a power can be portrayed, given forth to the patient that will help the patient very much. Now, these, these sciences still have to be learned by them. Perhaps time to come, it will come about. Hmm? <clears throat> There's no end to wisdom, really. There's no end to it. And we just hope, let me pray that may their minds receive this wisdom so that they could give this wisdom to others in its tangible form as well as in its intangible form. Hmm? Master question. There's a certain amount of conflict in many people's minds as to the degree of association between uh, consciousness of the inner self, the inner awareness, to the physical organism. And we're talking now about uh, damage, mental damage, or physical damage to the nervous system. Mm -hmm. Now, um, again, um, tell us something about how, how this would affect spiritual growth if it would, and uh, if it is possible for a person, say, who has had um, uh, nervous uh, damage to the brain, to the nervous system, to continue to expand his awareness. Mm. True. Right. Now the nervous system must not be confused As I was saying, <laughs> oh, Patsy's so sweet. <laughs> and what do we do with sweetness? We turn sweetness with sweetness. Hmm? <laughs> yes. Good. Now, when we talk of the nervous system, we must not just confuse the entire nervous system of the human being with the nerves that are visible. There is a finer level, a finer strata of the nervous system, which is not visible. So there too, it has levels between the grosser nervous system and the subtler nervous system. Now, with a person uh, who has had a nervous breakdown or some mental aberration or mental damage, we know that the difficulty there and the damage that is caused is to the grosser nervous system because the subtler nervous system cannot be damaged. So now, even with those people, there are techniques. For example, a normal person can do a mantra meditation or some other yoga meditation. But those people that might have these uh, mental damages that cannot do, as she has said, they won't be able to sit still, that cannot do these practices, for them there are other practices whereby the subtle nervous system, which is beyond damage, can be activated and brought that power brought forth to the damaged sections of the gross nervous system and heal it or help it. So that can be done. No one, no one is beyond hope. And one's spiritual progress does not depend upon any physical deformity. One of the greatest spiritual people in the world at the turn of the century, Ramakrishna, as you all would know, suffered a very, very severe cancer. 
And yet he was a great spiritual being. He was so away from his body that, 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 he, uh, uh, that he was oblivious of the cancer of the body. So, there again, there is hope. When a person is physically deformed in any way, or mentally damaged or aberrated, there's still hope for that person too. Because in the kingdom of God, everyone is alike. Everyone gets their full share. Perhaps with some, now the mental damage or the physical deformity uh, is there not by accident. It is there by one's karma. It is the effect of a certain cause. Cause and effect is an eternal law. You cannot deny it. So the sufferings of those people, the so-called physical and mental sufferings of those people, are because of their own karmic debts or their own lessons that they have to learn in life. Now, there are many lessons that cannot always be learned easily. Some lessons do become difficult. But through the difficulty, one progresses, so those very lessons become easy later. Like a child goes to school and starts off with mathematics, at first it's very difficult for him. But once he gets into it, once he grasps the idea, once he gets some of the formulas into his head, the very difficult, so-called difficult mathematical problems would become easier and easier to him. That is how uh, it becomes more and more joyous in the past. More and more joyous when things, although the same problem is there, but because of the understanding gains, gained, because of the strength gained by meditation, you know, they are better able, they are better equipped to tackle the problem. And when a person is better equipped to tackle a problem, the burden seems lighter. It is still the same weight. It might weigh 50 pounds. It is still that. But because of the strength gained, the burden is lighter. So we don't worry about lessening the burden. We don't worry about lessening the weight of the parcel, of the bag. We worry about making ourselves stronger. Because if we are strong, a weak person cannot pick up 50 pounds in weight, but a strong person, he picks it up with, a, with his little finger. So we make ourselves stronger. So, nobody has to lose hope. Never mind what physical or mental deformity one has, there is always a way. And perhaps those deformities were necessary for the man to learn. I was saying to someone this morning that life, we get born into this life because life is a school. We come to learn. And because of our karma, that might be a way for us to learn. The whole idea when we suffer of any affliction is acceptance. And once we accept that this was for me, this is the sum total and the effect of the cause, the result of my past actions. I accept that. And what am I going to do about it? And once we accept, we find ways and means to do something about it. And when we progress on the path of consciously wanting to do something about it in our waking state, then something gets done. And with the added help of meditation, that something gets done quicker, easier, with more joy, with greater strength. Because the very idea of acceptance is accepting a situation, and you don't only accept the situation, but with that acceptance of the situation, you are compensated by an indefinable strength. Because firstly, if you were not strong enough, you will not be able to accept. And it increases. Once you accept, that strength also increases with the acceptance. And when strength increases, 
the solution becomes simple. You find solutions. Solutions are not impossible. Every problem cannot be a problem if the solution was not inherent in it. Every problem contains within itself, contains within its makeup, the solution to the problem. Because there, um, the opposites would exist. Problem, solution. Problem, non-problem. And one cannot exist without the other, like a coin. You can't have a coin with heads only, you've got to have the tails also. Like that, like that. The whole idea is to face this situation squarely, to assess it, to use the little power of discrimination we have and say, this is the situation. Assess it in its true value with a calm and quiet mind acquired through meditation. You are better equipped to assess the situation. Once you assess it properly, the sting of it goes away and you accept. And that is how we progress. That is how we learn in the school of life. And that is the real learning, not gaining a few degrees behind your name. That is not learning. That is only a ticket to make a living, but not learning. Yeah, that's only a license to make a living. That's all degrees, things. Wisdom is something far greater, far, far greater. Okay. Sorry. Actually, this, this is quite amazing as well. Um, I have one question I would ask you, but you've been answering before. What is the same? Um, one question, um, which is sort of diametrically, I think, maybe opposed to all the other questions, and it's not sectarian or sectarian, but I would like to know why it is that females seem so more compatible to the deeper truths. And males in general. Do you think the males have felt a hair? Um, <laughs> it's a How's it that people find that females are going to rule this earth one day? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, 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 is very, that is very simple, really. That question is very simple. Uh, it is because a woman comes to the world with one of the aims of producing. Mm -hmm. They produce children. Now, to give birth to a child, a woman is equipped with certain qualities which the man hasn't got. She has qualities of greater gentleness. She has qualities of greater kindness greater compassion, greater forbearance. I mean, many that have children, they will know what a job it is to bring up children. They will know. So they are equipped with those qualities. And being more gentle, uh, being more kind, being more understanding to a certain extent, they would... Uh, be equipped to be more intuitive. And by being more intuitive, uh, they could perceive certain things that the man does not perceive. I'm not speaking of all men, but generally so. Uh, the man, of course, is a born hunter, as we know. You know, he is more extroverted. He is the protector. So the man's mind at many times dwells on external levels. They dwell on external levels to be able to earn, protect, and provide. For that, the attention has to be directed more in mundane matters to protect and provide. He has to draw his attention to more worldly matters whereby he's enabled to protect and provide. The woman, on the other hand, having those qualities of gentleness, kindness, forbearance, tolerance, 
can is equipped to go internal. There is the difference. The woman is better equipped to go internal while the man is better equipped to go external. There lies the difference. And it is only those that go internal can be more intuitive, can become more perceptive or uh, perceptive more quickly.